Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of Ask a Property Manager. This is episode number 85 and today is August 25th, 2021. We're coming to you from Studio 2.0 here at Own Buffalo. I'm Andrew Schultz, Principal Broker of Own Buffalo, Inc. And on today's show, we're going to be talking about FEMA overhauling the flood insurance program, when to charge a tenant for a repair. We're going to look at some questions from housing providers around the country and so much more. Before we jump into all that, we are going to plug our social media. New episodes of Ask a Property Manager drop every Wednesday morning, 10 a.m. Eastern on Facebook Live. You can also catch the replays on YouTube and on Facebook that same day. Don't forget about our Instagram. We post things there that don't make it on the other two platforms. And last but not least, don't forget about the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast. New episode of the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast drops tomorrow on Thursday. We're going to be taking a look at what to include in a tenant reference letter, when to return security deposits, and dealing with neighbors who use your property for their dog duty. So don't miss out on that. New episodes of the Rent Prep for Landlords podcast drop every other Thursday morning anywhere podcasts are heard or over at rentprep.com slash podcast. We're going to jump right into our news of the day here, starting with this article from CNBC. FEMA overhauls the National Flood Insurance Program for Climate Change. This is an interesting article because it talks about how they're planning on uh, reorganizing the flood insurance program. So I wanted to cover this because it does impact a lot of people around the country. Climate change and its devastating impacts are accelerating faster than ever, according to a new report from the United Nations Internet Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Hurricanes are becoming stronger, rainfall heavier, and flood risk higher, yet America's National Flood Insurance Program hasn't changed at all since its inception, but it's about to. Under the current program, the FEMA... Uh, under the current program, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, provides $1.3 trillion in coverage for more than 5 million policyholders in 23,500 communities nationwide. Homeowners in the FEMA-designated flood zones are required to purchase flood insurance, but others do so voluntarily. Nearly one-third of the policyholders are not mandated to carry it. Starting on October 1st, the program will undergo a complete overhaul to make insurance pricing more accurately reflect each property's unique flood risk. Finally, climate change will be factored in. No question that this is the most substantial change to the program going back to 1968, said David Mostrad, the Deputy Associate Administrator for Federal Insurance and Mitigation and Senior Executive of the Flood Insurance Program. What we found out was that many folks with lower value homes were paying more than they should, and those that had higher value homes were paying less than they should. We have a responsibility to make sure that we have accurately sound excuse me, actuarially sound, fair, and equitable rates. And so that's what's driving this change. Today, the federal flood insurance is based on the property's elevation and whether it has a 1% chance of flooding. Under the new model, FEMA will also look at the home's replacement cost, whether the risk is rainfall, river, or coastal flooding. Excuse me, let me close that. Uh, where were we at here? There we go. Most important, FEMA will now factor in future catastrophic modeling from climate change, including sea level rise, drought, and wildfire. Sorry about that. I lost my place for a second. Right now, the owner of a $1 million home in Florida and the owner of a $200,000 home in Montana are paying the same rates for insurance, even though their risk levels are decidedly different. Under the new model, the Florida owner would almost certainly pay more. Mostrad says that rates will go up for some and down for others. The majority of homeowners, however, We'll see rates go up about 10%, which is the normal annual increase. And by the way, I didn't realize that the normal annual increase for flood insurance was 10%. That seems very high to me. Um, that just, it just seems well above the cost of inflation. Well, maybe not, given everything that's happened in 2020 and 2021 with building material prices. Um, it's just as important that we address the inequality that lower value homes shouldn't be subsidizing the higher value homes going forward. The shift will inevitably change the value of some homes. The costs incurred by any home factor are factored into its value, whether those costs are insurance, taxes, maintenance on an older home, or the home's location. You can think of it as revenue coming in and expenses going out, said Matthew Ebby, a founder and executive director of the First Street Foundation, which calculates flood risk scores for every home in America. These scores are currently posted on some of the nation's largest home listing sites, including Realtor.com and Redfin. Depending on how much that insurance goes up is going to correlate perfectly to the value of that home for any new home buyer who comes in and says, this home looks great, but I now have to pay six to $10,000, whatever it might be, a year in flood insurance, which is just going to take away from the value of the actual asset itself, he said. 
covering the rising costs. The change in the NFIP calculation is not just to bring better equality to the program, but also to help sustain it. As storm damage increases, FEMA is increasingly paying billions of dollars out to homeowners who are uninsured. Hurricane Harvey in Houston was a stark example. More than 200,000 homes were damaged or destroyed, and three quarters of them had no flood insurance, as many were outside FEMA flood zones. Flood zones are updated only every five years by congressional mandate. During its reauthorization process this fall, FEMA will also put forward more proposals to make the program more fiscally stable. No question we need to close the insurance gap. Not enough people in the high-risk area have the coverage they need to be able to be on the path to recovery after a flood event. There's just too much disaster, suffering going on that we can minimize if we were able to have more people have the coverage they need. He said FEMA has proposed a means-tested affordability program that will help low- and moderate income individuals pay for the flood insurance that they do need. There's no question with the climate change and the changing conditions that if we do nothing, the program is not going to be sustainable. So it's interesting to see how this will pan out over the course of time. Obviously, I agree that this program, it sounds like it definitely needs to be overhauled. If you have people paying the same amount in insurance on a $200,000 house inland versus a million dollar house on the coast, there's gonna be a substantially different risk there when it comes to flood insurance rates. So I'm interested to see how this pans out. Um, I did make note that they do have the uh, the means-tested affordability program to help low and moderate income individuals. It'll be interesting to see how that plays out here as well. Um, but most importantly, uh, I'm wondering if this is going to result in another update of the flood maps. And every time those flood maps update, there's always some people that wind up coming into the flood zone that weren't there before. And there are also people that wind up leaving the flood zone that used to be in the flood zone those people that are kind of right on the cusp of the flood zones, it has a big impact on their property values every single time those maps are redrawn because it may change just like they had said in the article. Uh, where are we at here? I'm not gonna to continue to scroll through it here, but there was a mention in the article right here that'll shift the value of the home simply because as the cost of insurance goes up, someone's ability to pay more on a mortgage goes down. If you're talking about a, a pity payment, principal interest taxes and insurance, if you're factoring flood insurance into that payment and you have a, a hard dollar, you're not gonna go above this number, suddenly when you factor flood insurance in, you can afford a lot less house. So that's definitely something that's going to factor in here as well. I'll be interested to see how this progresses over time and see how things move along here. Um, this next article comes to us from the Lockport Union Sun and Journal. This is a local article with a little bit of local flair to it. And this kind of goes along with the articles that we've been covering in the past couple weeks of Landlords and tenants starting to get to the point where they're at the end of the rope, they don't know what to do. They find themselves in situations where they may not otherwise be in. Uh, this one is titled, A Renter Landlord Standoff. Resident speaks out on bed bugs, roaches, and mold in rental units. I'm gonna see if I can bump the size of this up a little bit. Uh, Joseph Vercruz has rented an excuse me, has resided in an apartment off Pine and High Street since 2017. His first year there went all right, he said, but then he got a new neighbor in the apartment house and things started to go downhill. They had asked to use our hallway to bring up a couch. That's when the bed bugs started, he recalled. Uh, he continued to live there, saying he only saw one or two bugs once in a while, but when his neighbor moved out in the summer of 2020 and took the couch with them, the bed bug problem grew, he said. The landlord hired an exterminator and this guy was a hack or something. He watered down the solution, and from my understanding, an exterminator is supposed to come and everyone else is supposed to leave. That wasn't the case. This guy came and talked more than he did work. Vricu said he told the landlord, Perry Kelly, about the bed bug problem several times and was met with no action. He keeps trying to blame it on us. He said it's the company that we bring over. Diana Gibson, a mother of young children currently residing in an apartment on Genesee Street, said she's looking for a new place to live because of the roach infestation she discovered after moving in. The landlord needs to take care of the problem, Gibson asserted. I have a lot of trouble with bed bugs, but this, I, I haven't had a lot of trouble with bed bugs, but the last apartment I had there was lead. Uh, the city should address common rental property problems, Alderman at large, candidate Maggie Lupo said. We have a high amount of rental apartments in the city, and I think bed bugs are definitely a health issue. It's a community issue too, like black mold and lead paint. If it's left unchecked, it becomes everyone's problem. If you move into an apartment and there's vermin there, it's not on the tenants, it's on the landlord who owns the property. Um, housing case backlog grows. D Jason Duell, chief building inspector of the city of Lockport, said that any city resident who faces a problem like this, be it bed bugs, black mold, roaches, or lead, should give him a call. 
We'll schedule an appointment and take a look. If a problem is found, the building inspection department will contact the property owner by a phone call or letter and issue a warning, clean up or else, he said. However, he noted the teeth his department once had were dulled by the COVID-19 pandemic. The problem we're dealing with is that the landlords aren't responsive for a number of reasons and we're having a difficult time sending cases to court like we were pre-COVID. He explained that until recently, the court uh, until recently, court was close to housing matters, and while it is open now, there's very little allotted time for housing issues. Where it once took less than a month for a property owner to be arraigned, it's now closer to two months or more, and a second court date, which used to be set for two weeks later, is another 10 to 12 week wait. We tar we tar excuse me, we're talking just maybe a four month span to get two court dates in, and even at the end of those court dates, I can't guarantee the problem will be remedied, Duell said. The goal for us in housing issues is for a resolution. We don't want to find anyone. We don't want anyone in jail because if it gets to that point and the problem isn't getting addressed, uh, ideally the landlord does what he has to do and never has to go to court. Duell suggested that many rental property owners are angry presently about not being able to collect rent, which exacerbates the problem. He suspects the building inspection department will field more phone calls about landlord negligence once the moratorium on evictions ends because runners will need to justify why they're not paying rent. I'm going to highlight that. We'll come back to it. Uh, they're correct, in my opinion, to not pay. Duell said, I believe the law states you can withhold a reasonable amount of rent based on the problems you're having. Duell noted a broken fire alarm might be one such problem or a lack of heat, as well as other situations. The really, there are really and truly a lot of people having issues that we can't help, he said. We don't have the proverbial hammer to drop in the end like we did before COVID to get these people assistance and into properties that comply with the state property maintenance code. Hopefully that'll change soon and we get the court uh, time down. I just don't have a definitive answer yet. Uh, Lupo said tongue in cheek that she isn't sure about requiring rental property owners to have renewable certificates, but she is a dog owner. Anything that be, could be going on with my dogs could be considered a public health issue. If they're not up to date on their vaccinations, that could be a public health issue. If I let them run uncontrolled, that could be a public health issue. So if I have to go downtown once a year to register my dogs with the city, Obviously, she's saying that maybe we should be renting, uh, registering rental property as well. Uh, it's kind of a weird way to look at it, but we do have a better. We do have to do better by almost half our city residents who live in apartments. She said. Uh, Vercus uh, said his living conditions are getting worse. To this reporter, he sent photos showing what he believes is black mold in his apartment, as well as the contents of his refrigerator after Kelly allegedly turned off the power to his kitchen. I don't know what else to do, he said. I've tried everything. The bed bugs are horrible. They're driving my girlfriend mentally insane because they drive you crazy. I spray. I use countless numbers of bug sprays. I spent hundreds of dollars to deal with a problem that's bigger than spraying. My run roommate moved out, said he couldn't stand it. The bed bugs were infested in this DVD player, in his air mattress, etc. I'm hoping the landlord will fix the problem, but I doubt it, he said. Right now, my hands are tied. I've got a baby coming, so I'm doing my part as a tenant. It's just he harasses me for rent money all the time and I hadn't paid rent for two months because he wasn't fixing the problem. It's just a hell of a situation. Landlord was contacted by the reporter but would not comment on the situation. Information about environmental issues and housing, call the Niagara County DOH, Environmental Health Division 439 excuse me, 7444. So there's a lot to unpack in this article and we're not gonna spend a ton of time on it, uh, but there are a couple things that I did wanna talk about here. Um, Duell suggests that many rental owner properties are angry presently about not being able to collect rent, which exacerbates the problem. He suspects the building inspection department will field more calls about landlord negligence once the moratorium ends. Yeah, absolutely, because tenants are going to be looking for the reason, just like he said, to justify why they haven't been paying rent. Um, the landlord needs to be prepared with how many times has this tenant contacted you reporting maintenance issues, has this tenant contacted you at all reporting maintenance issues, and be able to prove whether they have or have not made those reports um, when you get to a courtroom, because that's where this is likely going to find itself play out, is in front of a courtroom. Um, my issue with this is that the property owner is definitely in violation of the warranty of habitability here in the state of New York. Pretty straightforward, if you have a vermin infestation, you need to treat it. Um, Obviously, I don't know who brought the bed bugs into the property. It could have been any of the tenants. It could have been somebody who walked in to visit a tenant. You know, bed bugs are very, very mobile. If you have a couch, like what they're talking about in this article, that has bed bugs and you move it from one place to another, guess what? The new place is going to have bed bugs. It's pretty much a guarantee. So it's one of those things that anytime you have a piece of furniture um, that you move from one apartment to another apartment, from a bed bug apartment to a non-bed bug apartment, you're going to wind up with bed bugs. It's almost a guarantee. 
It also happens quite a lot when tenants buy either a used piece of furniture or something along those lines and bring it in. If it hasn't been properly treated and cleaned, a lot of times you'll carry in a bed bug or something like that. This is not a great situation for anybody involved. We don't know all the details based on the article here, um, but there's, you know, there's certainly treatment options out there for bed bugs, and it sounds like this landlord probably is going to have to step up and do some sort of treatment to try to deal with this, regardless of who brought the bed bugs in. It's an issue now that needs to be remedied. Um, the one thing that I will mention is, where was that? Let's see here, right here. So this was a comment by, I believe, Ms. Lupo, who is running for alderman in the city of Lockport, if I remember correctly, from up here earlier in the article. Sorry, guys, I'm just trying to scroll through here and find some information. Ba -ba -ba. Maggie Lupo. So she's an alderman at large candidate, and she's talking about putting in place some sort of a rental registration. Well, in the city of Lockport as a property management company, I already have to register as a property manager on every property that I manage in the city of Lockport. And as near as I can tell, it's just a money grab. It's just I pay a fee and they probably record my name in a database somewhere, but we've never been recontacted because we've been listed as the property manager, despite the fact that there have been incidents that have gone on at the property. So essentially we're paying you a fee to tell you that we're managing the property but you're not actually doing anything with that information. You're not contacting us when there's concerns or anything like that. You're basically just taking the money, putting it in your bank account, and throwing our contact information into a database that apparently nobody seems to have access to when there is a situation that arises. If you move forward with the rental registration, it's gonna be the exact same thing. And I can tell you that it's gonna be the exact same thing because that's what happened here in Buffalo. You pay your rental registration every single year, just like the city mandates, and literally it's just a cash grab. There's no value to the rental registration program. And if somebody can show me value to the rental registration program, please feel free to come to me and prove me wrong. But I see no value to rental registration programs um, because it's strictly a money grab. The database is kept so that somebody has access to the data, but whoever needs access to the data at the moment they need it, may not have access to it. So I look at those as a gigantic money grab. Just my two cents. Your thoughts may vary. Um, and if you are one of the people who thinks that a rental registration is a good idea, then tell me why and tell me what the justification is for it. Um, but from where I'm sitting, it just doesn't make sense to have a rental registration. I think that this is something the building department can tackle. Even Jason said that the building department, you know, it, they don't have quite the teeth that they had pre-COVID. They will get back to that stage once the courts start to clear things through and once some of these eviction matters get heard and things of that nature. But this is going to be the common thread in a lot of eviction cases moving forward. Landlord's going to come in and say, tenants either at the end of their lease and we want them to move or they are pursuing a non-payment. The tenant's going to come in and say, well, the landlord hasn't done X, Y, and Z because blah, blah, blah. And that's where, that's where the courts are going to have to settle a lot of these matters out. It's unfortunate that we find ourselves in this situation. Honestly, some of this was happening pre-COVID. It's gotten a lot worse since COVID hit, uh, but hopefully we can find our way through it because realistically, this is how society functions. So on to some funny stuff. Um, it, you ever lose a tool and you just can't find it? <laughs> it's happened to me, not quite to this level of severity, uh, but I'm constantly losing screwdrivers and hammers and stuff like that. And I kind of wonder how many of them I've just dropped into situations that I will never, ever ever recover them from. Uh, this is an emotional support cow. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. It was just an image that I found, but I could certainly see somebody trying to come across saying that uh, they need the cow for, for an emotional support animal. And I could, I could definitely see some of the less than scrupulous websites out there online offering certificates, emotional support animal certificates for cows. It would be crazy to see it, but I guarantee you that uh, if it hasn't happened yet, it probably will. Let's go ahead and jump into our questions from housing providers around the country, starting with this one on bank account software. Uh, we're not an LLC and we just use standard checking and savings accounts. Our preference is to have one checking for rent, mortgage, and maintenance payments and a savings account each for escrow and deposits respectively per property. However, most banks have limits on the number of checking accounts you can have, so we're investigating business accounts. How do you all manage the banking, uh, banking business accounts, one checking account for all, blah, 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 blah. 
then move money to savings types. Basically, they're asking about bank account structure. So this one starts with taking a look at your state law. In a lot of states, there is some sort of a law on the books that dictates what your accounting structure should look like. Generally, it's pretty straightforward and they want you to have an operating account and they want you to have a separate um, escrow account for your security deposits. Whatever you decide to do beyond that, as long as you meet the state's requirements, generally speaking, you're okay. So some states will dictate how those deposits have to be kept, such as in an interest-bearing or a non-interest-bearing account, et cetera. The bottom line is double-check your state law, find out what your state law is first and foremost before you make any real decisions, and then go from there. Security deposits should always be kept separate from your operating funds, and you should not ever commingle those funds. Um, realistically speaking, security deposits should be fully accounted for at all times. They need to be kept separate from your operating funds. And the best way to do that is to have a separate account for your security deposits. And then it's a non-issue. They're always accounted for. As for the account structure, I like to see a security deposit account and then an operating account. My recommendation is to break it out by entity. So if you have three duplexes in one LLC, I would have one operating and one security deposit account for that. Um, if you have a 20 unit building in one LLC, I would do the same thing, one operating and one security deposit account. Once you get over a certain number of doors, you may have to do some special accounting. You might wanna check on that. It's all based on what your state requires. Um, you can break it out by property as well. Some people feel more comfortable doing that. If that's what makes the accounting easier for you, then by all means, go ahead and do that. My one recommendation here is make sure that you have a really solid piece of either rental management, property management software, um, or good accounting software like QuickBooks that will help you to keep track of all of this stuff. My recommendation would be if you're a smaller operator, find a smaller um, software package such as Cozy, which I think is apartments.com now. Um, if you're getting to the point where you have a lot of doors, maybe look at a Propertyware, an Appfolio, a Buildium, something like that but get a specialized piece of software to handle a lot of this accounting back end for you. And it's gonna make your life so much easier overall. QuickBooks, I think there's a QuickBooks for rentals, but my understanding is it's not the best software out there. You can manage rentals out of QuickBooks, but there are better options out there at the end of the day. On to our next question, when to bill a tenant for maintenance? Tenant emails me and says the garbage disposal is broken and the sink drains slowly and will clog soon. I respond that it will be a few days before I can get anyone out there. Uh, the tenant gets an attitude like he's going without water or something. You mean it won't be fixed until the 27th? Which, um, for record, this was posted yesterday on the 24th, um, and we're talking about the 27th, about three days. Mind you, nothing in the least promises a garbage disposal. To me, it's a non-essential item. So I send the handyman over to take a look at it. There's absolutely nothing wrong. The drain is fine. The unit works great. So the handyman asked what the problem was. The tenant said that it was making a different noise than was expected, so he placed some food in it and showed them that it was working fine. I'm just worried that I'm dealing with somebody who's laying the foundation to be a professional tenant. The house was like new condition when they were, and they are nitpicking. I have not gotten back with them yet. Would you let it go as a first time, no harm, no foul, or would you tell them next time um, that they will be paying for the service call. So the first thing you need to do here is double check your lease and see if you have language in your lease that allows you to back bill a tenant for maintenance concerns. Um, that's pretty important. And if you don't have that in your lease, you need to make sure that you add it to your next lease before you sign another lease with any, any tenant, whether it be this tenant or another tenant. Having the ability to back bill a tenant for maintenance issues and things like that is critical. Not having it in your lease leaves it open to questions as to whether or not you can do it. My recommendation is just put it in your lease and then there's never a question about it. As far as this maintenance item goes, I would back bill this to the tenant. Regardless of the fact that it's a rather new tenant, they did make an unnecessary expense for you by stating that the garbage disposal is broken and that the drain was starting to back up, neither of which was accurate based on what you found when your handyman went over there. They essentially called in a non-issue and you had to send a handyman which cost you money and somebody has to pay that bill. So. If they owned the home and called a handyman for the same reason, that handyman's gonna expect to be paid regardless of the fact that there was no issue with the garbage disposal. It's the exact same situation here. Regardless of the fact that you sent the handyman or whatever the case may be, the handyman was called and needs to be paid. In my opinion, this was not any issue that you caused. Um, really, there was no issue at all, but there is an expense that was occurred and it has to go back to the tenant on this one simply because the tenant caused the expense. 
Um, if they own the home and they called for a handyman, they would have to pay for it. It's the same situation here. Regardless of the fact that there was nothing at fault, there was no problem found, there's still a bill that needs to be paid. So my explanation, my, my recommendation would be back bill it to the tenant, and that would be the explanation that I would give them is, look, when you call and there's not actually an issue, it still costs us money. So if it was legitimately broken, you would have covered the cost, and you can explain that to them as well. If there was a legitimate concern, because they're renting, you would have covered that cost, no problem. But there was no issue, so it, it falls back to them in my opinion. There may have been some more investigation that could have been done here. My first thought was, could you have done some sort of a video call? And there's a ton of different options for doing video calls at this point. Google has a video call option. Zoom has a video call option. Facebook has a video call option. If you're both on the same pl phone platform, iPhone or Android, you can you know do it that way. WhatsApp, million different ways to do a video call. And you might have been able to avoid this situation um, before it even became a situation. So that would have been my recommendation as to maybe a way around this before sending a plumber or a handyman out next time. Um, and further my recommendations, my recommendation would be get rid of this garbage disposal. Um, obviously this current tenant is expecting the garbage disposal to be there because they moved in with the garbage disposal. But when you turn that apartment over the next time, just get rid of the disposal. At least here in our market, tenants don't care whether they have a disposal or not. And I can definitely tell you that any apartment that has a garbage disposal, you're gonna have a maintenance issue with the garbage disposal eventually. Something's gonna get caught in it, it's gonna to need to be reset, whatever the case may be. You will have a maintenance issue tied to that garbage disposal. The easiest way to eliminate those maintenance issues is to eliminate the garbage disposal. So if, if you have to have a disposal in your market, your mileage may vary, but at least here in Western New York, garbage disposals, nobody really seems to care one way or the other. On to our third and final question, moving a tenant from one unit to another. Uh, I need some ideas on an apartment rental. I have, an, I have a good existing tenant that takes care of the apartment and pays his rent on time. His mom was in a car accident and he asked if she could move into his second floor apartment. Even though she has a walker, I thought she would be okay after the PT, so I approved. I have a vacancy now on the garden level that I put quite a bit of work into after the five-year tenant moved out. The tenant on the second floor is now asking if he and his mom can move to the vacant garden level apartment to accommodate her walker better as she would have less stairs to navigate. I'm not thrilled about the idea, but I'm wondering if anyone has ideas or experience in, on, in this type of situation. So there's a human factor and an economic factor at play here. Being on the ground level would definitely make it easier for um, this gentleman's mother to get around, but they did know that she was moving to a second floor apartment when she moved in. So there is a human factor there and it can be looked at from both ways. I'm assuming the lower unit is going to be renting for more than the upper unit, considering you just put a bunch of money into it. Um, it's now rehabbed. I think my first question here would be, will the upstairs tenant pay the new rent of the lower unit? If they're willing to do that, it may make sense to move them downstairs. It's easier for them. You know their history as tenants. Um, you know that they pay their rent on time. And it's you know one of those situations where it might make sense for you to just move the tenant from upstairs to downstairs to make that reasonable accommodation from a fair housing standpoint and see what you can do um, to get the, the down, upstairs tenant to pay that new rent in the lower unit. Um, the flip side to this is there is an economic factor at play as well. If it's going to take you five years to recover from the cost of the turnover on the upper unit based on the difference between the old rent and the new rent, then it may not make sense for you to move that tenant from upstairs to downstairs. Um, it's, it's simply an economics play at that point. Um, if you have a big expense in the turnover of the upstairs unit, like you're going to be rehabbing it or whatever the case may be, maybe you're gonna move from 800 a month in rent to $1,000 a month in rent. Well, based on that $200 a month extra, how long is it gonna take you to recover the funds spent on that turnover? If it's gonna take you an extended period of time, it might not make sense for you to make that move. Um, so there's a couple of different factors at play there. You're pretty much gonna to have to decide what makes the most sense for you, or if the tenant is actually requesting this reasonable accommodation as part of fair housing guidelines, then you might wanna look at it from a different perspective through a different lens, and you may wanna to speak to an attorney just to see what your requirements are there. Uh, another thing to consider is that they may not wanna stay in an upper unit long term, and at the end of their lease term, they might just go and find a lower unit, a garden level unit anyway. So if they're looking for a lower unit already and you know who they are and how they operate, 
Okay, now you have another factor. If they're going to be moving anyway at the end of their lease term, maybe you do want to save that tenant because you know you're going to have that turnover expense anyway in the upper unit. Maybe, again, it makes sense to move them into the downstairs unit. Um, so you may lose out on a good tenant altogether if you opt to just say, no, we're not, going to, we're not going to move you. So there are a lot of factors to consider here. This is not an easy decision to make. Um, there's definitely a lot of things to consider here. You're going to have to put some thought into this one and look at the situation I look at it from the human factor and from the economic factor and then make decisions. It's one of those situations where there may not be a clear answer. You may just be looking at it from a perspective of what makes the most sense for, for me as the operator of the property. So that's how I would handle this one. Your mileage may vary. Good luck to you on that. That's a tricky one and you have a lot to think about there. So that pretty much wraps things up for this week's episode of Ask a Property Manager. Thank you all so much for watching. I love producing Ask a Property Manager and you can help us to improve by dropping a question in the comments either on Facebook or on YouTube and your question may be picked up and answered in an upcoming episode. If you enjoyed this content or if we brought some value to your day, do us a favor and hit that thumbs up button. YouTube and Facebook both push videos based on community feedback, so every like, comment, subscribe, and share helps us to grow and reach more people. We'll be back next week on September 1st at 10 a.m. That's next Wednesday with another show you won't want to miss Thank you all so much for watching and we'll see you next week.